Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, now on YouTube, as well as wherever you listen to podcasts. We are so stoked that you're here. Peter, how's it going? It's going great. Yeah, we're getting into the fall, which we really enjoy cyclocross here at the Consummate Athlete and, and all sorts of, you know, these different sports we start doing as we start cross training in the fall. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like cyclocross is always our favorite, not just because we genuinely love the sport, but also because of all of the kind of cross training aspects of it. I mean, you were just coaching this weekend and we were kind of joking about there's a lot of people who really, you know, they go from road or mountain biking and then struggle to even, you know, be able to pick up the bike to go over barriers because they haven't really done any upper body or like the core required. And to that end, you're actually yelling at me during my, uh, my rose the other day that I was really letting my core sort of hang as I was trying to do it, which you're right, would not translate to being able to get over the barriers very efficiently with my cyclocross bike, because I'm definitely going to race this season, I swear. For sure. And so Molly's hinting at some of these cycling specific concepts that we talk about here on the show. But for those of you that are just joining us, you know, the consummate athlete, we, we speak towards different sports and different movements that sort of come together uh, to create a, a great human being and, and ways that we can integrate these as, as adult athletes into our life. Yes. And while a lot of what we talk about is endurance sport, obviously Peter's a cycling coach. I'm primarily a runner, but we've both kind of dabbled in pretty much every kind of endurance sport. Uh, a lot of what we really love talking about is sort of this more holistic approach to uh, health and longevity and mobility with a performance lens, if we're going to get really uh, fancy pants about it. Uh, so to that end, we've loved having guests on who talk about things kind of outside of just how to improve your FTP on the bike or, you know, how to run a faster mile. Uh, and that's why we were so excited to get Kelly and Juliet Sturette on the podcast. Uh, they are the owners of the Ready State. Uh, you know, Kelly started with the Mobility WOD YouTube videos way back. I mean, they've been our number one, I'm going to say, dream guests for a very long time. So when they came out with their most recent book, Built to Move, we were obsessed with the idea of getting to talk to them because not only have we wanted to talk to them for a while, but Built to Move is probably one of the best books that we've found on sort of this longevity and performance sort of almost combination uh, in a very long time. That's right. And so this book built to move. Uh, it involves 10 vital signs. And these are, are things, you know, in the way we think about blood pressure or some of the things you might get checked at the doctor, these are vital signs you can measure yourself at home uh, with very little equipment. These are things like getting up and down off the floor, a bit of obviously mobility stuff as far as your shoulder, your hips, uh, squatting, walking, uh, a couple little nutrition things in there as well. Uh, and and I, what, what was your favorite vital sign? Uh, I had originally said squats, but I'm going to change it to sleep because I think uh, A, Kelly is going to approve of that answer. And B, I would say like sleep has been something I've really prioritized over the last few years. I feel like, honestly, I didn't really have a choice but to prioritize it uh, after a lot of years of trying to kind of go, go, go. That's right. And I mean, why does this speak to us? I mean, what is a consummate athlete? If you look it up, it, it's someone who's, you know, sort of embodies this, you know, athlete self who is ready for anything, you know, put together these sort of words. Uh, so things where you would need to have a good base of health and wellness Again, joints are moving well, you know, body is recovering quickly, uh, the fuel coming in is, is good and appropriate. And so I, I do think that this book is a great handbook and a great, uh, something that's going to spur you to action as well. Yes. And very exciting for listeners. Uh, if you share the part of this episode that really, you know, spoke to you the most, maybe it's the vital sign. Maybe it's just like a, something that Kelly or Juliet says, uh, share it on Instagram or Facebook, whether you're sharing a chunk of the video, a little screenshot of the podcast, however you want to share it, uh, share yourself trying to do the up and down off the floor test or your, your deep squat. That's right. Uh, yeah, there's a couple in there that are very Instagrammable. It's true. Yeah. So share that and tag us and the ready state and a couple of people are going to receive a copy of the Built to Move book or a subscription for a few months to the Ready State app, which we really love. Like Peter shares it with clients all the time. That's it. Yeah. And I, I personally have, I had a bit of hamstring pain coming into this interview and, and actually the book just was perfect. And so a couple of things around sitting on the floor a bit more rather than on the couch. 
getting my standing desk back and then making sure I was getting my steps back up after a busy cycling season and traveling season. And lo and behold, the the injury, the the soreness, the pain in the back of my hamstring, it's gone. Right? I'm and pretty so- sure he just got the standing desk. So that way, if Kelly asked to see it, he'd be able to like <laughs> pivot the camera right. and show him. Well, I had to pass the vital signs. So. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. And then, yeah, the Ready State app is actually a very good handbook. If you're having any sort of ongoing knee pain, shoulder pain, whatever we have as we get into this adults as athletes, as people pushing it, you know, it is something that I'll, I'll give clients. I'll say, hey, go sign up for this. And, uh, you know, you're going to spend a couple hundred dollars on, on physiotherapy or whatever, but you should be able to do some of this basic maintenance, uh, which the Ready State app is, is going to be your handbook, your guide for doing this. Definitely. Uh, And if you are not lucky enough to be one of our winners, you should obviously buy the book, but also you can definitely sign up for their 21 day email uh, challenge. I don't even want to call it a challenge. Yeah. Just how do you take these principles in any book and and put them into action in a busy life? And so this is, it sort of just edges you into some of these things, you know, walk a bit more today, try this today. You know, can you stand a little bit more or try sitting on the floor? Right. And how do you sort of get these 10 vital signs up to snuff, if you will, you know, past the vital signs is sort of the the long term goal, but then also incorporate these movements because it's not just a test. It's also, you know, something that you're you wanting to embed into how you're living. All right. Without further ado, let's let Kelly and Juliet explain this. Uh, enjoy this episode with the ready state and don't forget to share your favorite moments. So you can potentially win a book or a subscription to the app. Where I actually thought we might start is is actually on that mountain biking topic. You know, I, I think a lot of our guests uh, are cyclists. And so I was really excited. I don't know a lot about your mountain biking pursuits personally. So I thought maybe if we just start there, like, who are you as a mountain biker? And, and I, I offer this to both of you. Sure. I mean, I'll go ahead and and I'll take this one to begin with. First of sure. all, Kelly grew up in a small Bavarian town in Southern Germany and began mountain biking in the eighties before mountain biking was like really even a thing. Um, it sounds like an Austin powers beginning of a movie. Yeah, it does not. But, That's but, where my uh, head so, went a hundred percent. Yeah. So he, he had some, you know, early childhood mountain biking experiences, um, you know, and then he really switched over to whitewater paddling and kayaking. Although, you know, he, he sort of having learned a mountain bike at such a young age, I think it's one of those things where it's like, he just sort of had it, had it there in the background, but it wasn't until about five years ago that I decided I wanted to take on mountain biking. I don't think so. I had, I had a time in my thirties where I did a bunch of road cycling and I, came to a point where biking around Marin County, where we live on the road, I decided that, um, you know, you did the death ride. I did the death ride. I did some, you know, like group ride things, but I actually found cycling on the road in Marin County where we live to be totally sketchy. And I was like, I had a couple of bad experiences on Mount Tam going downhill with traffic. And I was like, this is actually like, you know, while I have, I, at that time I had sort of a fear of biking downhill on a mountain bike. I realized that that fear was like, okay, I might break my collarbone if I go over my handlebars on my mountain bike. But if I'm here on my, on my road bike on Mount Tam, I'm going to die because it's just crowded and sketchy. So, so I decided I wanted to stay on my bike and get off the road. Um, Um, But I was a very nervous, not great mountain biker to begin with. And I have to give serious props to Kelly. And this is like my husband lesson for all husbands right now Um, to win as a husband. Maybe this is the only thing people will take from this podcast. But, you know, we started mountain biking together and like I started off not being able to make it over like a class zero obstacle. I had to like spend half my mountain bike rides hiking um, I was horrible at mountain biking. Um, and two comma huge engine. Huge so engine. It, it, the fit, I knew I knew the, the skill would catch part the fitness. Was not right? the problem, right? The fitness part was Three on the top, world I was, champion. I was like, definitely kid. I was a nervous mountain biker, didn't have the skills, didn't have sort of the childhood background of having the skills at all. I had some road road cycling experience, which didn't really seem to translate for me at all. And so, you know. He, I swear I would not be a avid mountain biker to this day if I didn't have in Kelly, the most patient partner known to man. Like Kelly had been your average bro who was like, I got to get my workout and be radical and be rad on my mountain bike. And there's no way I'm going to wait for my lame wife. I would never be a mountain biker. Like he was willing to wait as I hiked and was afraid to try switchbacks. And, you know, he was just 
truly the most patient person ever. And I think that's why I was able to get over the hump and, you know, uh, develop the skills to be able to be a functional mountain biker. And then secondarily, this is another revelation I had in mountain biking is I was always of the mind that it's like the person and not the equipment. And so I started you, off Lance Armstrong. riding on a janky bike with like nothing, no shocks. And it was this old, like specialized hardtail or whatever. And I was like, well, it doesn't, the bike isn't going to make a difference because I suck at mountain uh -huh. biking. Well, then, you know, I happened to be BFFs with Rebecca Rush and she saw that I was having a new interest in mountain biking. And she's like, hey, I'm going to give you one of my old bikes. And so she packaged it up and sent me one of her old bikes. And, you know, I went from like the jankiest bike known to man to a bike that was way too nice for my skill and ability level with like world champion rings on it. Hill. It had like world champion rings on it and P and her name emblazoned on it. So like strangers would stop me and Miranda and be like, you're on Rebecca Raj's bike. But anyway, I will say that that was a huge revelation for me in mountain biking because I went from literally in a single day, I swear on going from a bad, ill-fitting, not awesome bike to a obviously epically nice bike. My skills literally improved by 50% in a single day. So I was a convert at that point, point realizing that in, in that sport in particular, equipment does matter. So having a patient husband, and a really nice bike together. Um, and now we, we bike a couple times a week. We have a bike club called the fail state bike club, which we can tell you more about that. And so that's kind of our, our current mountain biking situation. We have a concept two bike in the garage and two watt bikes as well. So we do a lot of watt bike work. We love Sufferfest Now the, the Wahoo system app, um, we just love it. It's, you know, with it's funny and easy. And what I'll say is, um, I am not a small kid. So it turns out that heavy weights and power training, like you're going to play rugby or in the NFL for 20 years, delivers the body that you would expect it to be. So I am the biggest biker in the world. And <laughs> one of our, you know, we love, I'll just, so everyone knows, Julie and I really like, riding will be our sport that we do till we're dead. That's like one of the, the yeah, best like we, have, we love seeing the world. We we yeah. don't nature for time. We just really enjoy. We love being out Adventuring. There. And, you know, we love the community around it. But as a larger strength athlete, right, <laughs> who lets do all these things and, you know, works in the NFL and, you know, it, it's useful for me to be in this body now, but this is my body as I'm 50 years old. The mountain bike is the way in for so many sort of middle-aged bros who like to, you know, do a lot of things, but need an aerobic sport. You know, running is is great, but it's an expensive sport in terms of sort of the CNS fatigue, the load, you're punished. But the bike's efficiency really gives you immediate access, plus the advent of you don't need a $15,000 moped electric e-bike, but a little bit of a hand means that you can suddenly ride with your rad friends who are 160 kilos and you can keep up and not just be off the back dying. And so really what we're seeing is this gives us all common cause to go out. And frankly, as the older we get, you know, we need more zone two work. You need more base aerobic work. You need hours and hours of that, especially if you're already doing some of this high intensity work or we owned a CrossFit gym for 20 years. We've been training for sports. We never really loved CrossFit for training for CrossFit sport. We loved it for, Hey, here's a 20 to 30 minute, you know, sensible piece that allows us to go bike and paddle and ski and do all the things we want to do. But the bike, the mountain bike was the missing piece for all that. And we're just, we just give out mountain bikes like candy to our friends. We're like, you need a mountain bike. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. Okay. Actually, I want to come back to the two points you made about the, the patient husband, Juliet. I want to know how you had the patience because I think like your level of patience also really matters here because I'm a horrendously impatient person, which is why I don't get on, out on the mountain bike as much as I should. And a big engine, ultra runner, hundred mile winner. So right. similar in that there's an engine there. Um, so yeah, my same, same question, the same way is Juliet, how going into this sport as someone who's very proficient at another sport. And then with your husband, you know, <laughs> how was that? You know, how did you, what was your approach to that? Yeah, I mean, there were well, the one backstory I'll tell, which is actually a book we a story we told in our book, Built to Move. But um, one thing that motivated me was my own mom, who's very fit and lean and has always been healthy. But um, because she's never been a biker and hasn't sort of touched that that part of her life for many years, by her late 60s, she actually really didn't feel comfortable riding a bike anymore. Um, she felt like timorous on a bike and didn't feel like she had the balance for it. And I mean, I'm not talking about like she was gonna jump on and you know, actually 
actually become a cyclist. I'm just talking about like she didn't feel comfortable renting a cruiser on vacation to cruise around on the beach because she just didn't feel comfortable riding a bike anymore. So I, I will say that that sat with me a little bit in terms of like, OK, I have been on my road, my road bike. I'm afraid of being on the road. It's not really what I'm into. I want to get off the road. And and also, I, I do love adventure and being out in trails. And it's so beautiful where we live. So we're lucky enough to have massive access. So, you know, I just I think it was deter. I think because I am very impatient. Um, I think determination outruled my impatience in this case, because I really wanted to have a sport where I could get on where I could do it, you know, just from my garage into my backyard. And we are lucky enough to live in Marin County in a place where, you know, six minutes from our house, we could be on, on trails where we could ride for a hundred miles. Um, so I really wanted to, to pick up a sport that made sense where I lived and that was easy access and, you know, didn't require me getting in my car to go somewhere. And so I think that, I, I think that determination sort of, you know, but I mean, I had my low days, you know, when I first started biking, I would come back and be so tired and it wasn't again, fitness. It was my nervous system because, you know, I was like, Ugh, you know, like gripping my brakes and the stress of learning a new thing. But man, I also just feel like that's good for the brain too, as we get older to just keep the, you know, keep the cells growing and, and keep our brains active. I love it. Mm -hmm. Now the, the piece there you said about environment, I know you mentioned, you know, moving out and, and thinking towards like, can you walk to the stores? Can you, I guess, access to mountain biking? Um, talk me through that, like this, you know, when you're looking for a house, not everyone's always looking for a house and can set that up, but you know, when you're making that decision, how, how did you go through that and, and setting up this environment? And I think, you know, that's relates to, obviously to the environment piece with the built to move. You just want to get on Zolo and start looking at houses after this, don't you? I think we're doing okay yeah. with this, but. You're seeing the studio, you're like, we need a studio, we need to move. Well, and Kelly, I'm sure can add some color commentary to this, but, you know, we used to live in San Francisco in the city proper, and we knew when we had little kids, we wanted to move out and Marin County was an obvious place for us because we are like so outdoorsy and want to spend, you know, we love hiking and biking and, you know, having access to the outdoors was important to us. But Kelly actually happened upon finding the house where we live. And it just so happened to be within a stone's throw of a little market and a taco shop and, um, you know, a couple, you know, a community pool. And I think that's what helped us get over the hump of being able to leave the city where we could walk everywhere and move to the suburbs. I think, you know, obviously we liked the house, but the ability to be able to, you know, walk a hundred meters or 200 meters and get a gallon of milk without having to get in the car. I think that was a big thing for us. Are you going to switch back and forth between liters and, and meters and gallons? I mean, yeah, I don't know what going. I'm doing here. Yeah. But we have New Jersey and Canada on the line. Well, we have so. Bavaria and, you know. You know, in, in short, I think um, it's easy now for everyone because training is so rich that you can, you can get a Zwift, you can have the perfect training in your garage. And I think we've forgotten why we're doing training. We're spending all those time, all those hours on the trainer to go have more fun on group rides or riding with our friends, right? We're we're do we're subjecting ourselves to all the strength and conditioning so we can be durable enough to go on multi-day rides and crash and still feel, you know, more amortal when we come back to work. And you know, with that view, you know, Juliet, you know, we met at the World Whitewater Championships in Chile. Um Juliet and I have always, she's been always been my number one sort of training partner and play partner. So, you know, we ski and stand up paddle and river run and bike and lift together. So, you know, for, for biking for me, it was less of hey, I need to be patient with Juliet is that Juliet's my number one training partner and will be the number one person I adventure with the rest of my life. So if I was going to have a partner who wanted to do the sport with me, it was incumbent on me to just make sure we were stoked and that the experience she had on a bike was fun and felt safe. And it wasn't just like the suffer fest because we get plenty of that suffer fest in the training that we're doing. And I think it's been a natural sort of evolution that suddenly, you know, we, we just go back 15 years and sort of the dark ages in strength and conditioning and very much, you know, maybe someone has a heart rate monitor, or maybe they're, they've heard of what a watt is, but really that, really was the domain of the best athletes on the planet, not the domain of people using these tools to live better lives. And, and, you know, so much of Juliet and I have sport. We are lucky that I think we both had, you know, difficult childhoods and discovered sport as outlet. 
and sport as way of self-actualizing and really sort of a framework to understand who we were. But also we realized that sport is such a unifying tool that allows us to have immediate conversations with people who are also engaged in sport because you all ride and run. We know a lot about how you eat and how you feel and what your priorities are and why you have a roller in your living room and all of these things. So the sport ends up being a constellation sort of moment where the different valences of your life really relate back to community, fitness, durability, all of those things. And for us, that's always been a sort of a prime organization principle for us. And so everything is always sort of in service of that. And probably as Juliet points out that I have a little light ADD and it's how I self-medicate to exercise and move. And so really, you know, biking is just a natural fit. What's fun is that we also have all these superstar friends. We get to work alongside some of the best, you know, mountain bike road cyclists on the planet. And we've even, you know, spent a lot of time working with specialized as uh, ambassadors. And as so we, we very much identify now, I think that the bike is a really important way to transform our communities and hopefully transform our communities into these blue zones where, where, you know, we can add in bike lanes and suddenly kids are making choices about cars versus e-bikes. And really we have a moment, I think right now where the bike could influence us and the way we're living and the way we're interrelating in a really powerful way. Yeah, it's funny. I've written about that a few times with the stuff that's going on in Marin. Like there are so many great cycling initiatives happening uh, as far as like the quiet streets and stuff like that are going that started during the pandemic and are thankfully like continuing to go. Um, so it's very cool to to see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really cool to see things change on a policy level. One quick story I'll tell you guys is that, you know, before the pandemic, we actually voted um, to, you know, spend money, bond money to build a mountain bike trail. And then during the pandemic, it opened and it was super cool because, you know, I think a lot of the voting we do, you know, it doesn't you, you don't see a dirt, you, you know, you things are happening based on votes you've made, but they all it feels very distant to you. And that was really so fun for us because, you know, we remembered voting for it. And then one day this rad mountain bike trail opens, you know, like right around the corner from our house. And, and, we, were like, and we were like, oh, OK, you know, you can see it, just this one to one connection between making these, you know, and and it, I mean, it's packed. It's got hikers and, you know, it's it's really really cool to see how, you know, that just that simple policy and funding towards creating a trail did so much for our community. There's a new little downhill trail uh, near us, Solstice. And just we were the other morning, we we're just up walking early. Maybe it was Sunday. And there was a young kid. He was probably like nine. It was 830. And he had his downhill helmet on his pads and he was riding up pretty gnarly like buy-in just to go do laps on this downhill descent. It was so rad. really, if you, if you build it, they will come. But now also because we suddenly have, you know, e-bikes and better access, we have a model for people to start thinking about their weight, about their nutrition, about their recovery, about their sleep, about their alcohol consumption, about being in a community. And really, it, it ends up creating sort of waves. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is say, hey, look, the what we've currently been doing isn't serving our communities and our families very well. We're spending way more money on healthcare. We are sicker. We're less, we're less happy. We have more disease. Anything that you really care about is sort of trending in the wrong direction. And the real question is, where is the functional unit of change in there? And it turns out it's the household. And if it's- a, And the sort of local community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Household first, community second, neighborhood second. And that really is the way that we've come to believe that we're going to dig ourselves out of this sort of way of, of living that doesn't that everyone sort of agrees is less effective and less sort of fulfilling. Cool. And I think that's, you know, you get at that with the book and, and you certainly have the 10 vital signs. And and within that, I think that's the idea, right, is that you now have a handbook for these individuals, these communities to go and assess and see where can we embed movement, where can we embed this community into our, our days, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, did you want to take us through sort of just before we get too deep into this here, sort of this idea of vital signs and how you've used it and built to move? 
Sure. I mean, we think that, you know, it's such a critical part of the book and and what motivated us to use that phrase in the book was that during the pandemic, you know, like you guys, we have a lot of athletic friends and everybody's wearing a whoop or an aura ring and, and then, but, but, you know, we're all tracking all this complex data, like our heart rate variability and respiratory rate and, you know, all of this data, but we started actually seeing even a bunch of our friends who, who wouldn't describe themselves as athletes being pretty comfortable talking about some of these metrics. And so what we realized is we're like, wow, every Everyday people are are comfortable with the idea of a vital sign. I think the most common one we think of is our blood pressure. Everybody knows that, you know, 120 over 80 is sort of this like median blood pressure. It's not great blood pressure, but it's not bad. But, you know, you, you get that number and you kind of feel like you have a data point. You're like, okay, I'm doing okay. Right. Well, we, we thought to ourselves, why aren't there movement and health specific vital signs and especially vital signs that can be tested in your own home on your, you know, you know, in your living room um, so that people can kind of have some benchmarks about where they are from an overall health standpoint. And so, you know, I think realizing that vital signs are a concept that people are familiar with and actually familiar with expand, like we saw that people were familiar with expanding the idea of vital signs. So we wanted to just further expand them to include movement and sort of some general sort of lifestyle health vital signs. And so that was our goal in this book. And professionally, one of the things that we're tasked to do is come into communities, come into organizations, and they might be small organizations like the CIA or the army or the all blacks, right? And help people under understand and see their blind spots. And one of the things that I think everyone can relate to is that if you say, hey, biking is all you need, And if all you do is bike, pretty soon you can't stand up straight, your knee hurts, your back hurts, you suck at running, right? You have bird bones in your upper body and you're like, okay, maybe I need something else. And suddenly you're like, oh, it's cyclocross, it's running, it's triathlon, it's lifting. And what we realize is that we are constant adaptation machines and we're adapting to our environment. Our body is set up to adapt to whatever environment it's in. And what we find is that If we don't help people identify blind spots, you know, potentially sort of maladaptation or or specific adaptation that may limit movement choice or may limit sort of health options, then what we end up having is sort of surprise when something goes off the off the rails. And so suddenly if your hip hurts, but you've got no hip extension, that's a problem. If you're, you know, you can put out, you know, what was the sixth place finisher in the world uh, championships? He just in the first 90 K put out an average of 328 Watts for 90 K. I mean, that's phenomenal. There's no way that that person doesn't pay a cost for that. And it's easy to get sucked into, look, I'm making progress in this, but I'm losing my ability to get up and down off the ground or my quads are getting very stiff or I can't put my arms over my head. And unless I'm getting paid a lot of money to have that hyper special adaptation, it's potential that I'm setting up a blind spot for myself. And so if I have some vital signs, It allows me not to say, not to have to freak out or play this game of constant whack-a-mole, but it allows me to create a benchmark for myself where I can begin to understand how my body is doing and where where my relative reference marks are. And if I'm red, yellow, green, and if I'm red on something, then I need to focus on a little bit. (laughs) Excuse me. I love it. And, you know, you you talk about the idea that, you know, if if I was a 20 something World Cup mountain bike racer, you know, these vital signs are still as relevant to me as someone who's 50, 60, whatever age, you know, trying to keep mountain biking or and and then also, you know, get through the day without pain. Um, Can you talk to me about that? Like, what's the rationale there? Like, why does a 20 year old need to do the same stuff? We have spent the last, I don't know, 20 years working in high performance environments. And what we've always felt like is that the goal of the reason we're working in high performance is that that is a testing ground where we can really understand inputs and outputs because we're under load and speed and volume demands and competition. But if we didn't want to just have sport be circus and entertainment, then ultimately our goal was to take those lessons we were learning in high performance and transmute them so that we might improve our families. We might improve our children. We might improve our sort of our local communities. So through that, what we find is that what's good for the goose is also good for the gander very much. And that the sets of behavior principles that we know help reduce session costs, allow us to work harder, allow us to be more durable, also translate back over. So 
what we find is that we often are asked to come in and help, you know, elite athletes, world champions get better at their jobs. And these basic principles are often missed because people are so advanced. They kind of skip over things. Oh, I don't need fruits and vegetables, fiber, sleep, da, da, da. you know, so when we start to sort those things out, we actually see that we can improve performance. Likewise, you know, if you're, if you're a world champion trying to go faster, chances are you need to be doing these things if you're not already, but also they are the basis for you to create a durable practice. Yeah. And, and I would just add too. I mean, <clears throat> Kelly alluded to this a little bit, but what we've seen working with athletes over the years and you know, we're not immune to this either as sort of health enthusiasts. And we see a lot of people, even sort of recreational athletes who get super excited about all the bells and whistles in the fitness space. We're you not, know. yeah, the, you know, we, we, I can't tell you how many people we know who can tell you what their heart rate variability is, but can't actually tell you the last time they ate a fruit or vegetable, um, you know, or, you know, people who are huge sauna and ice enthusiasts, which we are as well, by the way, we're fans of those practices, but, you know, report that they slept for five hours last night and, you know, haven't eaten any protein recently, <clears throat> you know, or can't get up and down off the ground or walked 1000 steps last, you know, the last month, every single day. Right. So, so what we see is that in the, in the recreational athlete set in particular, we all have a tendency to skip over the basics in, in favor of the sort of shiny bells and whistles that we're putting forward in the health fitness and wellness industry. Um, and those things are great, but we believe that those things are almost, they almost need to be earned. You know, you, you've got to earn your supplements by making sure you're eating, you know, 800 grams of fruits and vegetables and enough protein. And then if on top of that, you still need to supplement great. You know, if you are getting sleep and enough movement in the day and, you know, you feel like you want to add some additional stress in your life. Great. Do some saunaing and ice bathing, huge fans. Um, but we've seen too many recreational athletes and, and, you know, we've been prone to this ourselves, skipping over the basics in favor of the like fun, cool stuff that looks great on Instagram. And so we're trying to say, Hey, you've got to check the boxes on the basics. And then if you have time and money and extra energy, then you get to, do, you get to do all that extra stuff. And it's crucial to understand that Juliet and I don't like to play defense. We're not in the game of like, Hey, let's work on your balance because you may or may not fall when you're 65. Like children are like, your feet are weak. You're getting poor transmission to the pedal because your feet are so shut down and you're not springy and your dorsiflexion sucks. And why don't we work on your tissue health so that every single time you ride, you're not also just stiff and beat up for three days with this tendinopathy that limits your ability to be rad. So ultimately we're always, keeping our eye on wattage, output, performance. But the the central idea here is we know that these practices allow us to handle more volume, reduce the session cost of the last training session so that we can continue to, to do the things that we love to do. Because I'll tell you, as soon as you ride yourself off the bike, and everyone has had this experience where you've ridden yourself off the bike, your back hurts too bad, your knee and you cannot occupy your role in the family. You can't do your job. You can't fitness the way. You don't have a way of managing calories or stress. Tell me how important that hip extension was or the fact that you have engaged in none of these things that Juliet are talking about. And that's, that's really where we have this opportunity to level up and start to create a base camp set of behaviors for people where when you then come in and you're needing to talk to a coach or you're needing to talk to a physio or you want to tweak a little thing, we're turning small dials. Because what we know is small hinges open big doors and we're all obsessed with that comma, let's make sure that we're doing first things first so that we can actually get to the really fun stuff and understand, frankly, inputs and outputs. Mm. I love that. Now, how do you convince people to get on board with this before they're at the off the bike <laughs> point? Because I think that's that's probably the hard part. We all sort of need to hit that like rock bottom before we're convinced to change behaviors. Yeah. I mean, I will say that um, this is the billion dollar question and Kelly and I would be billionaires if um, we got people to care before they got injured. I mean, I think unfortunately it is human nature, 
um, you know, m- most people come to us and, you know, want to work with Kelly or come and find our, you know, uh, app and program on the ready state when they have already experienced an injury or are just stiff. Um, but oftentimes it's when people are either injured or they can no longer do the thing they love to do athletically. You know, that's what drives them to realize they need to make a change. So <clears throat> I think some of that is maybe unchangeable because that may just be human nature and it's really difficult to get people to care. Um, But, you know, I think as we talked about when we were talking about mountain biking earlier, we have been trying to help people care. (laughs) And, you know, one of the things we talk about is this idea that your movement, uh, your ability to move through your environment is like a wide open hallway. And when you're young, you know, you're 20, you can get on a bike and you can run and you can do all these things. And as we age, inevitably, we all see that movement hallway start to be able to close. Like I don't really run that much anymore. It doesn't feel that comfortable on my hips. And that's another reason why I like biking. But, you know, I I love to say that, like, you know, when I was 35, 25% of my friends were recreational runners. And by the time I turned 45, it was like 5% of them, right? You just see like running is the best example of how that movement hallway starts closing for people. But I think, you know, Kelly and I, for example, one of our goals is to still be able to ride our mountain bikes when we are 80. And that may be an e-bike and that may be on fire roads versus single track trails. I mean, that may look differently. Negative. I'll be hot. But what we kind of challenge people to do at any age is actually think about and maybe even write down your 5, 10, 25 year movement goals, because it's common practice. You know, we all are, are theoretically, we should be saving for retirement. Most people are trying to save for retirement. That's a, that's a form of delayed gratification for sure. You know, we all sit down and make business goals. Anybody listening to this, who's an athlete has done some kind of race or event. So you're like, okay, I'm going to do, you know, the death ride in two months. I'm going to work backwards from the death ride and I'm going to do the things I need to do so I can survive riding the death ride. This is so common in athletic communities, but I think we just need to extend that out a bit farther in our lives. We can do short, middle and long-term movement goals. And, you know, what is your movement goal in five years, 10 years, 25 years? You know, Kelly and I just turned 50 this year. So in 25 years, we're going to be literally 75. And our movement goals are to be able to continue to ski and mountain bike and hike. Like that's what we want to be able to do with our bodies when we're old. So as though we are training for a race, that's our race. Our current race is, you know, trying to be functional old people. And we have to work backwards from then to now and start making sure we're doing the things we need to be doing now to be able to do those things. Um, You know, again, there's going to be certain people who are going to wait to get injured before they care about this. But, you know, I would challenge anyone listening to actually start thinking about that and writing those things down. The other cohort or the other sort of side of that is when we can demonstrate immediate effects, then people have buy-in. So really it's about getting buy-in. So we all are looking at resting heart rate and sleep and uh, because we understand that those are leading indicators, behaviors that allow me to go faster and drop my friends. All the metrics that I have are lagging indicators that tell me about after the fact, what happened or my, my body's response to them. But if we can get you doing 10 minutes of soft tissue mobilization, 10 minutes, that's all I'm asking. Get on the ground, roll around for 10 minutes before you go to bed. And what you'll see is roll your left quad for five minutes, roll your right for quad for five minutes. Don't get sucked into the drama of your hips or something else. Just tonight do that. Tomorrow night do something else. You'll see that your sleep latency will improve. Your deep sleep will improve. Your heart rate variability will improve. And then the next day you're going to work a little harder. And so suddenly what we see is we get something for our inputs. Otherwise, no one is going to, I mean, you know, recently someone sent us all these ketones, like this is, this is it. And I was like, these things taste terrible. And like, I don't, I'm not going to drink these before I go ride for a small bump in my middle-aged mountain biking performance. Like I suck on the bike. I'm way too heavy. It'd be easier for me to just drop 20 kilos and be faster than to take this ketone. So when we can demonstrate solid connection between our behaviors and our outputs, then we really do capture people's imagination and we don't have to sell it, comma, what Juliet said also. Uh, and you're, Juliet, you were talking around sort of this movement hallway, which I think is going towards this updated, I'll say, uh, definition of mobility that you're using. D- is there anything more around sort of this concept of mobility? You know, you, you were both sort of touching around it there, but I want to sort of just get that definition of mobility in there um, because that is pretty central to this built to move 
idea, I think. And it has evolved from the 2010 mobility wad days a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it has. I mean, I think, you know, we now are saying that mobility is the ability to move freely through your environment without pain and p- and to be able to do the things you want to do with your body physically, whatever that may be, whatever that may mean for you, you know, and everybody has wide ranging movement goals, but everybody has some kind of movement goal. You know, no one is saying my movement goal is to, you know, park in my, or maybe there are some, but you know, probably no one listening to this podcast has the movement goal of parking in a lazy boy chair for the rest of their lives, right? So whatever your movement goals may be, turns out that your ability to move freely is a critical part of that. And, you know, it is, it is, it can be a use it or lose it scenario. You know, if you don't ever get up and down off the ground, it becomes difficult to get up and down off the ground. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can sort of expand that on in, in a lot of different ways. It's the same, you know, with cyclists. If you don't ever put your knee behind your butt, your knee is always in front of your butt. It's going to be hard to put your knee behind your butt, right? So some of this is just about, you know, practicing, you know, practicing shapes that your body naturally should. Did you just make a knees behind butt guy reference? Well, I, yeah, <laughs> Kelly, by the way, I was just teeing Kelly up, you guys, because his, um, favorite subject in life is hip extension and he loves to talk about it. Um, so I don't even know why I tried. Well done. Well played. Yeah. It's all you anyway. <laughs> so that's our, that just to, to circle it up, that's our kind of updated and definitely more accessible, um, definition of what mobility is you, because you, I do think it's poorly understood. And I think people don't totally know, is it stretching? Is it range of motion? Like yeah. what actually is it? Um, and I think if we, we really want to step back a little and say, Hey, this is what it actually means. And this is how it impacts your life. If you don't have it. If you ever had a bike fit, really a good bike fit, we're looking at your anthropometry and your angles. And a lot of times, you know, I'll talk about some of my work with specialized, you know, body geometry, the bike fit process is really elaborate and really good to get a good, good, highly reproducible bike fit. The problem was no one was actually fitting the body to the bike. They're always fitting the machine to the body. And so if you come in missing huge amounts of being able to bring your knee to your chest or internally rotate your hip, you're going to end up, or your ankle doesn't move, you're going to end up with a bike fit that works and adapts to a very suboptimal, effective machine, your body. And so ultimately, the reason we want people to care about range of motion is that it allows us to express better power and have more movement choice and movement solution and movement economy. We see decreased expenditure working with your native range of motion. So if we can restore what your body is supposed to do with every physician, physical therapist, Cairo says, this is what the shoulder does, this is what the hip does, it shouldn't be crazy that we're like, why can't I do that? Imagine if you and I are having a romantic dinner and I suddenly can't bring my elbow to my face. You would be like, what's wrong with your elbow? I'm like, nothing, it doesn't hurt. And I still PR'd on my bike ride today. And you're like, but your elbow doesn't flex past 90. I'm like, it's not a, not a big deal. I just have a really long fork. And I'm just part of the long fork club because, and you know, and this is how I express myself. Meanwhile, you're like, dude, it's so weird. Your elbow doesn't bend. And that is literally what's going on with your knees and hips, people. And that I'm like, why are you doing that weird thing when you should just be able to bring your hand to your face? Because that is a native experience. And one of the mistakes we made, I think, and we are working remedy is that we didn't have really good tests. So being able to squat all the way down with your feet together, heels on the ground, for example, is a really nice expression of normal range of motion, being able to do that. And and if you don't have full ankle range of motion, full hip flexion, you won't be able to do that. You'll fall over and you can still be world champion, right? I'm talking to Juliet over here. You can still be be a collegiate rower, right? You can find sports and adaption, but ultimately what we're always chasing is, hey, let's get you back to what your body should be able to do because it's a constant adapting machine. And second, when we have pain, we need to talk about your range of motion and never ever do people conjoin or connect their inability to express native ranges with why their brain may be sending a pain signal or why may they have a tissue that's overworking. So if your knee hurts, and you can't do the couch stretch, which is one of our hip extension tests, you should connect those dots for yourself when saying, hey, I can't do this fundamental thing. I wonder if that's contributing to why my knee hurts. Yeah. And I mean, in this, you know, recreational athlete and cyclist community, I mean, 
the amount of money and time we see folks in this community spend on doctors, orthopedists, physical therapists, chiros, imaging. I mean, we get emails on a daily basis with, you know, the amount of time and money people have spent, um, you know, trying to solve these problems because their hallway is narrowed and they haven't been able to do the thing they want to do. And, you know, people get very panicked when this happens to them. Right. And, and so what Kelly's saying is, you know, if people can just make that slight connection between range of motion and pain, that there's so much that people can do on their own, on their living room floor to, you know, fix their own pain and injury and stiffness without having to go to those great lengths to, you know, see every professional known to man. But somehow, you know, people have to make that connection that first order of business, you know, unless you're, unless your femur is sticking out of your leg or you have what is obviously a catastrophic injury where of course you need to go to the doctor. But when we're talking about this everyday nagging pain, injury, stiffness that every recreational athlete experiences, everyone who's ever listened to your podcast has said something like this, right? We could get everyone listening to this to take a second and say, wait, a, you know, like I have knee pain, just like Kelly said, I'm going to test myself in the couch test, which is in our book, and I'm going to see if I'm missing all of my range of motion. And if I am, that's probably a big contributor to my knee pain. And, you know, it's, you know, we're just hoping to make it really simple as like a reference book where people can have it sitting on their coffee table and be like, uh oh, my shoulder feels a little tweaky. Let me go to this book and see if I can test myself. It's also important to understand that one of the th features here is that when people have don't have access to their range of motion, they're very sophisticated about their training and nutrition and all these, some of these other pieces. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know how to restore how your hip works? So what we're really trying to do is say, hey, let's take what we said in the beginning, our fundamental idea was that training gave us a template to understand ourselves in the world. That's what sport does theoretically. So the cycling gives me a, a reason and a rationale, a test and retest variability that allows me to say, hey, how do I take care of the body? And that might mean some inputs that look like some soft tissue mobilization or some end range isometrics or some sort of simple behaviors that allow me to restore or manage my sort of basic self and understanding. Ultimately, you'll come down to understanding sort of a certain pathognomonic, which is a term for it's a cue about something that you want to fix. So for you, we all on this call have different width pelvises. Believe it or not, I'm 6'2", but I ride the narrowest saddle that Specialized makes. I have a super narrow bum. I always talk about this. Yeah. I uh, So I literally wrote this book called Saddle Sore, A Women's Guide to You and Your Bike. Uh, where I talk all about saddle width. And I always say my dad, who is like a 300 pound, like five foot nine guy has a narrower saddle than me. And yes. no one thinks about that. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited that you just said that. <laughs> so I ride this power arc saddle. It's narrow and it's actually a road saddle on my mountain bike. But guess what? I have zero issues. Like I like, I'm like, Oh, we're riding again. We're riding again. That's, right that's again. the like, dream. That's the dream. The dream. Yeah. But knowing that about myself, one of the things that happens then is that my actual, I have my knees look like they flare out a little bit because my pelvis is narrow. So my femur comes out of my pelvis and someone who has a wider pelvis, their femurs would be a little bit more parallel. Mine is a little bit narrower. So my legs, that's why look he looks like, like a circus bear while he's biking. I look like just to give you guys a visual pelvis. image of what he's talking about. Those listening, on a little bike circus bear. That's right. So what ends up happening for me, for example, is that my adductors tend to get stiffer, my inside of my thigh. That's where I feel fatigued. That's where I'm stiff. And if I don't stand, not my quads, not my hammies, my adductors, that's my personal cue that if I've been riding a lot, and look, I've worked on good technique. I've had bike fits. I understand how all this works. This is my anthropometry throwing up its red flag saying, hey, I need you to pay attention here. And if I stay on them with just a couple things, my back never hurts riding. If I don't do those things and ride a bunch, I wake up and I'm like, wow, my back is achy. I wonder why that is. Hmm. It's because my unique adaptation to the bike is going to be different than Juliet's unique adaptation of the bike. And ultimately what we're trying to do is say, hey, what's the minimum effective dose of you being able to care for the machine so that you can do what you want? And I think again, pain can be a really big driver of change. We want people to understand that pain is a request for change. Pain is our way of saying, hey, let's pay attention to that, or we need to change some aspect of the physiology. But ultimately, we have this range of motion sets. 
And then we have a set of behaviors over here that do influence our pain system, sleep, stress, nutrition, hydration, decongestion, all of those things are going to matter. So what we tried to do is say, hey, look, here's two sets of sort of variables, some lifestyle variables and some range of motion variables. And if you keep an eye on those and play towards ultimately getting 10 out of 10, being kind of 10 green lights, what you'll see is that the things you care about will improve. I love it. And then you can keep maintaining those, right? I think that's what we were speaking about that today. It's Molly's like, okay, so it's good. I don't need to do it anymore. And I'm like, no, you probably, you gotta, I, you gotta, I, I, I love that. The, the, <laughs> what I did, I did brutal lactate intervals. Yeah. Like last week, do I have to do them again? Like, you know, I right. think what people understand is it's not necessarily one and done, but if you fall below a minimum threshold, let's get you back up to that threshold. That's why we're constantly understanding what's going on. And by having some vital sign benchmarks, it allows us to say, hey, I, I'm doing okay there. Quick test. I'm feeling all right. Or, hey, I've been on this red eye. We just traveled to Europe, right? We were sleep deprived. All our metrics are off. That's okay. It allows me now to come back. We just went through the world championships. I had, I don't know, four friends competing right there. And what I what I'll tell you is they you should look at the mountain bike. Yes. They should look like they just ra raced the world championships. They should have crappy range of motion. They should be weak. Everything should be peaking towards that. Now we have a chance to come back and say, okay, let's let's re-level and reset for the rest of the World Cup. And I love thinking about that almost as a periodization where, you know, yes. the, and in the very elite as well, right? That it, they might go that way, but then coming back in the, certainly that general preparation period. Um, I wonder, you know, we've talked about sleep. We've talked about the squat a little bit, the leg. Extension. We didn't talk about sleep at all. We just okay. gave lip service to sleep. It's true. I love it. Um, would, well, do you want to go? You jumped on it. So do you want to say how, how are we measuring sleep? That's always contentious. Like, is that, do I need to buy a whoop or, or how, how does the vital sign of sleep work? Then? And to be fair, Peter well, has jumped on every piece of technology that does measure sleep. Oh yeah, me too. Those original like sleep strap things like 10 years ago. Yes. Oh yeah. You and me both, you and me yeah. both. Well, we had just started dating. I thought he was a total weirdo. Um, um he I, was, but then accurate, you accurate. You yeah. went in there. I have like two stories to tell you guys, and then this will connect to sleep. I promise. So the one of the first um, heart rate variability measuring tools came out way back in like 2011. Omega wave. Uh, it was Omega wave. And a friend of ours sent it to Kelly. And at this time we had two little kids. Like I want to say our kids were like three and six or something. So they're like high maintenance, high maintenance kids, especially in the morning. You've got to like get them ready for school and tie their shoe. And it's like a lot. There's a lot going on. So Kelly gets this Omega wave, but it requires them to get up and then be up for 15 minutes. But then he has to go lay back down for 15 minutes with all these like nodes all over his body. And, you know, after a couple of weeks, of this, I was popular. like, I was like, hey, so if you want to stay married and be part of your kids lives like this technology is not going to work for us at all. So fortunately, obviously, it's become way less, you know, um, impactful on our days. You can just wear a ring or a strap or whatever and get tons of good data. But then the second story I want to tell you before we talk about actual sleep is Kelly was on a podcast maybe five or six months ago. And we posted a 15 second clip of it on our Instagram where Kelly says this, he says, you need to get seven or eight hours of sleep a night. And if you are training for an event, if you want to recover from surgery, if you want to grow muscle, if you want to be creative at work, you, you lose really weight. lose weight. You need to be really leaning more towards that eight hour number than the seven hour number. That's it. That's all he said on this 15 second clip. Seven is our minimum. And this thing has like 4 million views now on Instagram and like 10,000 comments hate comments. and eight of the 10,000 comments are like very angry and very upset that, you know, Kelly would suggest that you need seven or eight hours of sleep. And all these people think they're special flowers. And this was really eye opening for us, I think. And, and part of the reason we were really excited, hopefully, to get our book built to move out in the world is that we live in Kelly and I and you guys, I'm sure too, live in this very athlete centric world. Um, and I think it's pretty well understood in that world, you know, people who care about athletics and are training that you need to get seven or eight hours of, of sleep. And in fact, every sleep organization on earth says this, this is not actually, it shouldn't be contentious. Like unlike how much protein you should eat or how you should train or some of these things that, you know, reasonable minds can differ. Reasonable minds don't differ on the sleep thing. No organization or researcher disagrees that people need seven or eight hours of sleep. 
Um, and so this, I think, was so eye-opening to us because I think in our industries where we are and, and the kinds of people that we associate with because we're athletes, it, it is sort of well understood that you need to get this amount of sleep. But to see this much anger and dissonance over that post shows us that, man, we have a lot of work to do to step outside of our, you know, little vertical of health fitness people and get the message out, you know, into the broader world that sleep is super important. You know, we consider it to be like a keystone habit upon which all other good habits form. So we were working with earlier this year, last fall, a uh, two-time world champion in a different sport. And when we got, cause we're again, coming in to talk about position and mechanics and output, but I always ask, tell me about your sleep. Well, I struggling with sleep. Well, tell me more about that. You know, and, and can I see your sleep data? Because I don't believe you, like you're underreporting or overreporting. So what we found out though was that this athlete was underfueling, wasn't looking at the windows, wasn't fueling, wasn't eating adequately. So we just made some small changes, a little bit of protein right afterwards for rehydration. Maybe just thinking about, hey, let's not go out and and beat ourselves up for three hours and not drink and eat anything for three hours, even though your heart rate's 170, right? And it's very powerful. And then miss a window and et cetera, et cetera. And this athlete put on 12 pounds in, and it's a non-weight sport. So don't worry, don't freak out, cyclist. It's and good um, 12 pounds. Yeah. it's good 12 pounds. And they put it on six weeks, heart variability improved, resting heart rate improved, sleep improved. But that sleep was very much a driver of fuel, by, driven by fuel and recovery. And what I want everyone to understand is that when Juliet says it's a keystone habit, we suddenly realize that, hey, if you're eating late at night, boy, that's going to really impact your deep sleep. If you are drinking caffeine late in the afternoon, because we love coffee as as cyclists, I guarantee you that half-life of that caffeine is ghosting you and haunting you in a way that you don't appreciate and is messing up your deep sleep. The alcohol that you drink, we know that one of the early Whoop wins was that when Whoop looked at their athletes who were drinking, even a single drink was affecting heart rate and heart rate variability for days after. And so what we saw was that when people can make inputs, output connections, again, we change behavior, but the sleep suddenly starts to become an organizing principle. Hey, I didn't want to get enough steps so that I can accumulate enough non-exercise activity fatigue so that I can sleep. And suddenly we can really start to see what's what. And that's why we don't just gloss over it because we do talk to a lot of people about who are injured or in pain and under don't understand why their body is not performing when it always has, when suddenly their body can no longer buffer this lack of sleep or poor quality sleep. Hmm. Yeah, it's so good. And I guess really the, the 10 um, concepts, the 10 areas that you've looked at in this book, uh, part of the beauty is that they are interrelated, but there's also hopefully one that is more accessible, right? Whether that's, you know, I, I redid the standing desk, you know, I was like, oh, that's I should give that another go for he sure. He panicked. He was like afraid you would like quiz him on if we had one or not. Or something. Yes or no. <laughs> yes. So, um... Yes. Yes, yeah, you're like, yes, yes, I do. Yes. yes. Like I can turn the camera and show you. And, and if we were doing a testimony, I mean, I think it's, it is like, we always joke that, you know, the best way to keep, you know, yourself productive and doing all these things is you just keep reading these books. Right. And then you're, you know, you're, oh yeah, I got to sit up straight here for sure. And, you know, oh, less sitting, got to get on the floor and do this. Um, but I would say just with decreasing my sitting time, you know, a lot of computer time and that stuff, definitely a couple of the niggles I was having as we came into this book, you know, already just n- nothing fancy, just a little more standing at the computer and a little more sitting around, you know, on the phone or watching TV or whatever. Um, yeah, sleep you know. less of an issue for us. I'd say that's probably our like. You guys are winning at sleep. Yeah, we're crushing. Yeah, and you know, I think that just makes the point. You know, you guys made this point earlier, but I think in the athlete set, like you guys, what we're seeing is that you know, you know, if we if we put this book out into the real general public, they're getting a zero out of ten. Right. But when we go into the athlete set, most most athletes are, you know, they're getting a green in some areas and a red in some areas. And so that's why, you know, for the athletes who are listening to this, it's like the goal here is for you to discover the blind spots. You know, we work with a lot of CrossFit people, of course, and and you probably have a lot. And of shout out to listeners. Rich Roding, who just got the buckle at Leadville. Yeah. So CrossFit multiple nice. world champion did it in eight, eight and a half hours or sub eight or eight and a half. I can't remember. But, you know, what, what we've heard from a lot of CrossFit people is they're like, well, why would I walk? You know, because we're obsessed with walking. Why would I walk when I could run? 
run. And I'm sure a lot of runners listening to this would feel the same thing. Like, why would I, why would I walk when I can run? Uh, um, cyclists, cyclists would just say, why would I walk? Period. Yeah. Why right. would I walk at <laughs> all? Right. And so in, you know, in the so CrossFit slow. set in particular, what I think, you know, the takeaway for many CrossFit people who've read this book is like, wow, okay, I'm crushing myself on a really hard, really difficult CrossFit workout for an hour, but then chances are I'm sitting there for the rest of the day. So I think that's been a real eye opener for the CrossFit set of people. And, and also for just the recreational athlete generally right there, often moving a lot, doing their sport, but then they're not moving at all for the rest of their day. And so I think that's been, you know, that, that piece of just adding more movement, overall movement into the day has been a real eye opener for the athlete set among other things. And one of the reasons for those of you who are not privy to this is that your lymphatic system, which is the sewage system of your body is bootstrapped into your muscular system. So if you're trying to remove the waste and decongest the tissues, which is a normal process after intense exercise, we need to keep those muscles contracting. So you could jump on something like a Mark Pro, right? You could be pumping away or you could do a low, low, you know, spin, or you could just walk around. And uh, really just freaking walk people. And what you'll find is that you will adapt more effectively to your training. So, you know, we're less interested in that you get the 8,000 steps so you can have this reduce in mortality and morbidity. We're interested in, hey, you're not actually moving to decongest enough. What you're doing is you're smashing yourself on Strava to win. And then you're coming, sitting at your computer. And that is how we kill racehorses. Racehorses are not allowed to race and then go back to the barn. They go ride around and they're walked and they are cooled down and they continue to move. Again, they don't just race and go to the barn, but that's what we're doing as a human animals. And what we see is that creates a lot of opportunity well, yeah, for stiffness, you just incomplete like, response. You know, my obsession with the Tour de France, but you see those guys ride for five hours in the Tour de France and then they spin for like a whole hour. After, I mean, there's like, it looks so exhausting when you see it on TV because you're like, wow, you just rode up the Alpe d'Huez and now you're still spinning on the bike under the tent for an hour. Right. And so I think, you know, as recreational athletes, we tend to just be like, sweet, I went for my two hour mountain bike ride. And now I'm on the couch drinking a cappuccino. Right. We we're not doing that. Women's but... World Cup is on. It makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We could talk for hours. And yeah, I'm, seriously. again, so thankful <laughs> that you two took time to come to the Consummate Athlete today and chat with us just for a little bit. Um, we definitely love your new book, Built to Move. Uh, we've signed up my mother and I'm on it as well, but the 21 uh, Day love Movement it. Challenge. So mom and I yes. are going through, we're breathing, we're getting off the floor. She's 70. Mom nailed day one, getting off the floor, no problems. Yes. Um, so yeah, so everyone Go should mom. check that out. And Ever let stick. me... Let me jump in there and say what you're referring to is we did create a companion video guide to help bring people bring along, help bring along people on this adventure. But one of the things that we really feel strongly about is that you are talking about performance. We wanted to give you a template and a tool to bring it to your family. Because we see that, again, this functional unit of change is this household family community. And what we found was that a lot of our family members could not relate to our austere lifestyles. Like we we're suffering and pouring gas on ourselves and you know being crazy. And this was an entree in to say, hey, come along. Let me show you what we've learned. And this is so accessible because we think we can. you have the power to transform your community and your family. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. Okay. Where can everyone find, follow, get the book? You have an app, all the things. Quick. Awesome. Hit. Well, uh, you can get the book anywhere that you buy books. Um, you can sign up for, it's a free 21 day built to move challenge at built to move.com. And it's great to have the book, but you don't actually have the book to do. You don't have to have the book to do the challenge. Um, I am at Juliet Starrett on Instagram. Kelly is at the ready state on all the channels. Um, you know, and we do have an app, uh, out there called the ready state for people who, you know, just need a little help and love, um, on the maintenance side of their body. So people can check that out as well. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with us today. This is the best conversation. Oh my gosh. Thank yes. you guys. And it's we, all we, we think we about. So thank you for uh, facilitating our nerdiness. We, we we consider this a formal invitation to come um, join our bike club in Marin. If you guys find yourselves in California, should be back out this winter. So careful what you ask for. Yeah, it's, true. <laughs> it's, it's an honest invite. I meant it. Thanks so much for tuning into the consummate athlete podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox. 